Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Five Minutes Sarcoma Talk here on Onco Daily. I'm your host, Shushan Hovsepian, and today we have a fascinating topic to discuss, immunotherapies in soft tissue sarcomas. And for that, I'm honored to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Sandra DeAngelo, who is a distinguished medical oncologist working at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, specializing in the care of soft tissue sarcomas, bone sarcomas. So welcome, Dr. DeAngelo. Angela, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Thanks so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I'm so excited that uh, there's interest and attention to sarcoma, a uh, disease that's uh, near and dear to me. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, let's start. So immunotherapy has emerged as a promising treatment approach for different tumors like uh, melanomas with exciting results with PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors. But where does immunotherapy fit in the treatment landscape of sarcoma? Let's find out that now. And my first question would be, could you provide an overview of current immunotherapy approaches being utilized for soft tissue sarcomas? What have been the most significant findings regarding the efficacy and clinical outcomes of immunotherapy treatments in STS? So a really important and complicated question. Uh, I think just a little background, uh, the challenge obviously in sarcoma is that sarcoma is not one disease and one diagnosis. In fact, it's a disease that's characterized by 70 to 80 different histological subtypes and how we approach care and how we conduct clinical trials has really impacted uh, where the field stands. And in general, there's been a trend towards histology-specific clinical trials and approaches. And I think that has led to some of the more interesting and promising findings um, in the field. So uh, I'll break immunotherapy broadly down into two categories. First is checkpoint blockade and specifically monotherapy checkpoint blockade. Uh, the FDA approval that we have in the United States uh, is just in alveolar soft part sarcoma. In ASPS, um, we see a promising response rate with a tezolizumab of about 30 to 40%. And that drug was actually recently approved in the United States. And it is in fact the only FDA approval for checkpoint blockade in sarcoma. That being said, we've seen hints of activity which have allowed us as a field to uh, offer these therapies through NCCN listings. Uh, to that end, we've seen promising uh, responses in undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcomas, where pembrolizumab has shown a response rate of about 20%, and D-differentiated liposarcoma, similarly, pembrolizumab has shown a response rate of about 10% as well. And, um, and to that end, uh, you know, we feel that those are uh, promising options because chemotherapy in those respective diseases have quite similar response rate. Then sort of shifting gears a little bit. Um, the other uh, efforts have been centered around adoptive cell therapy, specifically T cell therapy. And much of the work uh, with that has really been centered around synovial sarcoma and mixoid round cell liposarcoma. And specifically T cell therapy that targets cancer testes antigens, such as MAGE-A4 with a drug called the Famacel has shown a promising response rate of 40% which is durable well beyond the year uh, and really one of the most uh, promising immunotherapies uh, in our field uh, at this time. And a FAMA cell is actually um, currently being reviewed at the FDA for potential approval, uh, which would offer a promising option for our patients with synovial sarcoma. In addition, there's been efforts uh, with other cancer testes antigens, namely NYESO, and recently at ASCO, we presented data with Letty Cell. And Letty Cell actually similarly demonstrated a 40% response rate in synovial sarcoma and mixoid round cell liposarcoma. So T cell therapy is uh, limited to these two uh, histological subtypes. Importantly, T cell therapy is limited to specific HLA blood types. So this is not something that's broadly applicable. But that to me highlights uh, where the field needs to improve uh, on and, and do better and offer alternative options for our patients. Uh, the other important effort uh, with immunotherapy has been in the neoadjuvant setting. Uh, Dr. Kirsch uh, recently presented data demonstrating that pembrolizumab in the neoadjuvant setting uh, prior to resection in undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma and D-differentiated liposarcoma 
uh, actually improved uh, disease-free survival. An important uh, and interesting study uh, for those patients uh, because uh, adjuvant therapy and sarcoma is complex and, um, and the standard of care or the presumed standard of care, I should say, is typically with uh, doxorubicin and ifosfamide. At times, patients, older patients are not candidates for uh, this intensive chemotherapy regimen. And so uh, pembrolizumab offers an alternative. I think the study was a promising one and an interesting one. And it also now uh, adds an additional approach for patients who have extremity uh, UPS or DDIF lipo, um, and one that uh, certainly will be included as a, an alternative way to treat patients. So those are, and then, then the last disease I'll highlight is angiosarcoma, which also uh, specifically uh, cutaneous angiosarcomas. Um, there's been a number of studies that have been published that also have shown promise uh, demonstrating uh, efficacy, um, uh, mostly with monotherapy and cutaneous angiosarcomas. And so all of what I've discussed has really just been in the context of monotherapy checkpoint blockade. Yeah, thank you very much for summarizing that. And it's fascinating to see the progress being made with checkpoint inhibitors and other immunotherapy approaches. And uh, my next question would be, uh, how are combination therapies involving immunotherapy and other therapy modalities like chemotherapy, radiation being integrated into the treatment protocols? And what benefits have been observed from key studies in this area? That's a great question. Um, so there's been a number of efforts um, with combination strategies. Uh, broadly speaking, adding additional drugs to the checkpoint blockade backbone has not had a significant improvement in the context of most sarcoma subtypes. Just to highlight some of the studies, um, I conducted a study of nivolumab with ipilimumab through the Alliance Cooperative Group and we did show that the combination had an overall higher uh, numerical response rate. The trials were not designed to uh, statistically derive a difference, but broadly speaking, with nivolumab and ipilimumab, the response rate was uh, about 15 to 16%. And with monotherapy nivolumab, um, it was about five to 10%. We then conducted expansion cohorts specifically in UPS and uh, D-differentiated liposarcoma, and we were able to uh, recapitulate those data. Obviously, the important thing is that you want to balance that with the added adverse events and understanding whether uh, it's worth those additional toxicities uh, based on the uh, sort of marginal improvement in efficacy. Uh, there were similar studies with durvalumab and tremolimumab, and so adding that second immunotherapy compound may or may not uh, be worth it um, for most uh, histological subtypes. Um, a disease that I'd like to call out though is again, angiosarcoma. There was a clinical trial of nivolumab with cabozantinib that was conducted by the Alliance group and led by Dr. Junigo Olson, who's a, a sarcoma investigator at Duke. And in that study, she demonstrated that the addition of nivolumab uh, to cabozantinib uh, led to a very promising response rate of almost 60%. So this is probably one of the highest response rates. And what was remarkable about that particular study is that the efficacy was not limited just to cutaneous angiosarcoma. In fact, the efficacy was shown in a number of different angiosarcoma subtypes. And so I look forward to future efforts in that particular disease with that combination. I imagine there'll be more uh, confirmatory studies uh, in the future. When we look at the uh, combination with chemotherapy, interestingly, in the context of that alliance angiosarcoma trial, there was also a cohort that investigated the additional of paclitaxel to nivolumab. And so the design of that study was paclitaxel with or without nivolumab. And interestingly, we did not see an improvement with the addition of nivolumab. Uh, actually, the, the efficacy uh, and the PFS, the response rate, are, were quite sim similar. So that's an interesting finding. On the contrary, my colleague at MSK, uh, Dr. Rosenbaum, conducted a trial of gemcitabine docetaxel with retifanilumab, which is another uh, checkpoint inhibitor. And in the context of that study, he reported um, high response rates in a cohort of angiosarcoma patients, it was about 10 patients, the response rate was close to 80%.
And so to me, these data highlight how much we don't know, uh, why paclitaxel was not effective, why uh, gemcitabine docetaxel seemed to have some hints of activity um, that seemed to be higher than the chemotherapy alone. Uh, it leaves a lot of unanswered questions and also highlights the need to better understand the diseases and, and, and the correlative work will obviously enhance uh, these clinical data. I think that's an important piece of, of the efforts, not just conducting the trial, but actually trying to understand which patients benefit and which patients do not. Uh, there's also an up upcoming study of doxorubicin uh, with pembrolizumab conducted through uh, our ECOG cooperative group. This is going to be led by Dr. Seth Pollack. Uh, again, this is based on some data that the combination seemed to yield higher response rate. I think that'll be an interesting trial because it is randomized. And so we'll be able to really tease out the additional benefit of the checkpoint blockade on top of chemotherapy. Yeah, that's super interesting. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, explaining all that. But uh, I imagine that there are also a lot of challenges uh, with the application of immunotherapies. Uh, what are the main challenges, limitations, and how you researchers uh, address these issues? I think one of the biggest challenges is being able to um, select which histologies we conduct which trial in. I think uh, as a clinician, we want to offer all our patients uh, the options that we think are promising and the options that we think will improve on the standard of care. However, conducted in a clinical trial with all sarcoma subtypes, we learned as a field that even beyond immunotherapy, it's not the right way to run those trials. And so we're sort of limited and uh, limited to selecting uh, and conducting these trials in, in histology specific cohorts. Um, and building uh, building on the efforts, if you see a signal signal of efficacy, then you can sort of build out to other uh, histologies. So I think that the, the challenge is more the disease and how complex and how many subtypes there are. I think what's wonderful is that our sarcoma community is actually quite tight knit and there are avenues and mechanisms for us to run clinical trials through cooperative groups um, and through uh, collaborations. And so I think regardless of the challenges, I think we're able to overcome those challenges. And to date, we've run a number of studies that actually I think have improved upon uh, the standard of care and, and offered alternative options for our patients. Yeah, and now let's uh, shift uh, to pediatric sarcomas. We discussed about uh, adult type sarcomas, but what promising developments or future directions do you foresee in the field of immunotherapy while treating pediatrics of tissue sarcomas? Are there any emerging studies that you find particularly exciting? So as an adult medical oncologist, uh, I'm not an expert in caring for, for pediatric patients. Um, some of the efforts obviously do overlap. So for example, the T-cell therapies and synovial sarcoma are potential avenues that um, are offered to patients, um, uh, pediatric patients. Um, but beyond that, um, the struggle in pediatric sarcomas um, is actually similar to the struggle that we've seen in adult sarcomas. Uh, uh, but some of the markers of that can help us identify patients that are most more likely to benefit, such as high tumor mutational burden or increased immune infiltrates, MSI high status. Universally, those are typically not found. And when we focus on pediatric sarcomas, often I think about translocation-driven sarcomas. So diseases such as Ewing sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and then a completely different disease that's not translocation-driven, but that also has proven to be difficult to treat in the context of immunotherapy is osteosarcoma. And, and so I think that um, there's more work to be done in the pediatric uh, space. And we work closely at our respective institutions with our pediatric colleagues to be able to design clinical trials that will allow pediatric patients to enroll in you know, pediatric specific cohorts, uh, but certainly more, more work to be done as well in the field. Yeah, that sounds uh, promising. And uh, lastly, what are the top five immunotherapy drugs, generally speaking, in sarcoma, in your opinion? Um, so it's 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 a tough question for me to boil it down just to five particular drugs. Um, I think that again, the categories of the drugs to me make more sense, and the advancements in each of the respective histologies also kind of point towards the promise. 
Um, as already we discussed, you know, T cell therapy of Famicel and Letty cell, I think those are promising, uh, probably promising drugs that are nearing, uh, at least the Famicel is nearing approval, we hope, and then Letty cell hopefully next. Uh, in the context of checkpoint blockade, I think that perhaps we need to kind of think beyond uh, these particular pathways. And there are some uh, sort of new and promising agents uh, uh, such as bispecific ant antibodies that target numerous parts of the immune system that may be sort of coming to the future that may offer alternative options um, for patients with sarcoma. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And uh, before wrapping up, I would like uh, to ask about your personal journey. What inspired you to become a medical oncologist and also specifically what inspired you to work with uh, sarcoma patients? Sure. So um, it's interesting. My journey into the field of oncology evolved uh, through my exposures and, and care of patients. So when I started my internship, at NYU, um, at the time, one of my first rotations, actually my very first rotation was at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, as an intern where I actually was uh, tr um, asked to be the night float intern. And so I sort of walked into Memorial and covered the night shifts for two weeks. And after that two week experience, I said I would never come back to Memorial Sloan Kettering because it was so challenging and so difficult and so stressful. Uh, but something drew me back and I actually was uh, wound up doing some outpatient clinics and it's really in the clinics where I was exposed to the promise of oncology. I think inpatient oncology is different than outpatient oncology. In the outpatient setting, I learned a few things. Uh, one, that we provide uh, an anchor and support patients through a very difficult journey. And uh, patients rely on us to be part of their team and guide, kind of guide their ship. Uh, the other thing is that we help patients through standard of care and, and, and chemotherapy and targeted therapy and immunotherapy has really uh, changed our approach and how we care for patients. And then uh, sort of just as important is really how research and clinical trials and advancements are sort of intimately integrated into the care of patients. And it was really that exposure, that MSK that inspired me to want to uh, contribute to those advancements and do more than the standard of care. And together, those things sort of inspired me to, to conduct, you know, continue my training. And I continue my training at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and I've been working there uh, since completing my therapy, my training. And so I've never left since that initial uh, two week period as an intern. Um, and, and I think it's just been a, an exciting journey being surrounded by leaders in the field and, and, and those that have really um, had impact on, on patient care in a very promising and exciting way, I think continues to inspire me day to day. Uh, thank you for sharing your inspiring journey. And uh, also, thank, uh, I would like to thank you uh, for joining us today. I think it was a very informative and insightful discussion. And uh, join us for our next episodes. Uh, thanks a lot and bye. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.